Okay. Um, I'm going to just keep this out of presenter mode on the Google Doc uh, because it's kind of easier because I'll be jumping back and forth with notebooks and things. So, um, so pardon the mess here. Um, so thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I am Tim Houlihan, as you mentioned. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, machine learning in R. This is high-level general overview, um, so not intended to, you know, this assumption that you sort of know machine learning or predictive analytics um, and not really intended to get into specifics and that questions of learning R, but more just an overview of how you would approach that with R and how you could get started, uh, kind of a survey of the techniques available. Um, quick brief background on myself, I work at Dialog Tech. Um, for folks in Cleveland that have heard of Mongoose Metrics, that was a startup in the area that was purchased and rebranded as, as Dialog Tech. There's an office in Chicago, one here in Cleveland. Uh, we work to help CMOs and marketing departments understand conversations better. There's analytics about where the calls came from, what was said on the calls, a variety of things like that. Uh, but ultimately ties back to um, advertising pipelines and things. Uh, so one of the teams that I work with is working on several classification problems, um, and so uh, that was a good fit for an area I'm interested in. Uh, our team works tends to work in Python. Um, I like to work in R. I help organize the R user group. Um, occasionally I get to use R to prototype something, but when I work with the team, I generally have to, to jump over to Python. Um, I like to use uh, Kaggle as a learning environment, sharing environment. Um, for folks not familiar, I would recommend checking that site out. Um, it's just Kaggle.com. Um, in the slides, which I'll post uh, to the uh, Meetup group, uh, I've linked here to a YouTube video that is, uh, if anybody saw this, uh, the CEO, Anthony Goldboom of Kaggle came and talked at the Cleveland uh, Hadoop user group. Um, recently, and this is this is that talk, but given somewhere else. It's, but it's essentially the same material. Um, an excellent talk. He kind of goes through how Kaggle works, all of those things, and, and uh, what type of algorithms are dominating. Uh, a variety of topics um, that are, I think are worth worth hearing. Uh, so, a quick plug. You know, uh, Tui already mentioned the the. Meetup user groups, so I'll link to that in the slides. Um, it's a variety of programmers, statisticians, and all folks in between. Um, and I, I should have said that in my background, by the way, um, where uh, I've heard several folks in the room mentioning they're from more of a science background or stats background. I come from a software development background. Um, so that's, th that is the world of data science these days. There's not a lot of folks coming out with uh, that peer degree, so most folks are either from a mathematical or uh, clinical background that are trying to learn programming, or vice versa, programmers that are, are becoming interested in stats and, and those type of things. Um, so it shows when we uh, talk about some of the math and formulas. Um, our next meeting is June 22nd, but I also, um, which is great, anybody should come to any of our meetings, but I really want to plug that uh, Ju uh, July 12th. Um, for anybody who knows R, Hadley Wickham is world-renowned in R. Um, author of a number of packages uh, in the R community, works in our studio. Um, his classes are thousands of dollars through our studio and things like that. Um, he's all, all the way from Texas, and uh, uh, his folks reached out to arrange to come speak at our group. So Progressive's been nice enough to host that so we can get their big auditorium. I'd highly recommend that for, for anyone interested in R. Um, so first, just a couple of quick notes of, of, or observations about machine learning in R and some differences from other environments. Um, and actually, maybe that's a good point to pause real quick and take a survey of the room. Like, just a general hands up, hands down, you, you know, you've worked in machine learning, have not worked in machine learning? Either or both or what? Which one's not? <laughs> so, so the hands up, the hands up is, is you have worked in machine learning. Okay, so I'm seeing about five here. So, uh, uh, other folks, anyone need a definition or something quick and helpful, or you just know what? It, okay. So, um, so in general, you're you're forming a model on data, but as opposed to um, as opposed to it being purely descriptive, you there's some some very non 
mathematically sound things you do to try to generalize that model so it can be used to predict for the future. Um, so there's a variety of ways uh, we'll get into where you, uh, the incentive is to hold some data out of the model built you're building so you can use that to validate that the model correctly predicts. Um, and so um, I think it will become self-evident we go through the, the data that's fairly straightforward with cars. Um, so one of the things with R about machine learning though that's a little tricky is we kind of talked about this even as, you know, as a, the user group, the mentality of some folks are programmers, some folks uh, you know, are engineers, and some folks are scientists, statisticians. So R is a language by statisticians for statisticians. The terminology is, it is mathematic, it's academic, it is very specific, um, the documentation matters. You'll see in here that, that a lot of classical statistic modeling terms come into play. If you were to go take a Coursera course on machine learning in Python and it's very practical and hands-on, you're just going to see common costs, you know, common terms used like cost and weight and these type of things. Um, or they tend to pick, you know, the, I took a Coursera course where uh, theta was always the weights for, uh, for your, any kind of uh, algorithm. In R, um, it tends to be more, you know, they're going to choose the, the Greek letters that were more mathematically traditional for those type of modelings. So just, there's just a little bit of terminology trip up. Um, we'll walk through some examples of that. Um, so for folks also who have poked around this a little bit, you probably see this packet uh, package caret, which is really an acronym, so it's sort of odd to pronounce, um, referred to. <coughs> and it gets referred to like it's a package for specifically of machine learning algorithms. And it's really not. It's kind of a meta package. It's a it's a wrapper for a bunch of other packages that do various algorithms. So there's numerous neural net packages, numerous regression packages, all those things, and they all had a slightly different surface. And Carrot came in and said, okay, we're always going to split data between testing and training. We're always going to try to tune hyperparameters. We're always going to you know, do these variety of things uh, in regression or classification. You're always going to need a confusion matrix. So it wrote repeatable interfaces for doing that. It wraps all of these things. Um, and we'll look at that today. Um, the last thing, and actually I was, I was having a conversation in the back to this point directly. Um, as far as I know, there is no current R machine learning packages that support using the GPU. Um, and where this comes into play is that your structured data um, problems, you know, if you get on, uh, Kaggle has, for example, the Titanic problems, or regression problem where you're predicting whether someone survives or not. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these problems that Kaggle um, has paid competitions where you don't have access to the real data. On the Titanic one, you could just cheat, right? You could download the Titanic data set that's public data, but the idea is more to hone your skills, right? So that data fits in there, you know, structured data, it has a schema, it fits nicely into uh, any algorithm, dynamic languages, works well. Um, we met, uh, several of us from this group, uh, a couple of Saturdays ago to deal with the Kaggle uh, digit recognizer problem. The, that's using uh, the MNIST handwriting database data on about 50,000 records, 780 something features, um, and uh, that's a challenge to go through a neural net. And um, I was actually finding, uh, trying to write a script on the Kaggle page, which is a, a Jupyter notebook, and Kaggle limits those to 20 minutes of runtime, and I hit that runtime on R. Um, where I put that in a TensorFlow on the weekend that we met up with uh, on a machine that had a GPU uh, that it could access and it could train it in under 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and so for deep learning problems right now, you would either want to look at a cluster of our servers um, or you would end up in a world where you would hand roll your own neural network. Um, if you, uh, there are packages in R to do matrix and uh, matrix multiplication and linear algebra structures, all of that stuff on the GPU, but you would be using that library raw and doing your own uh, implementation of the neural net. For a feed-forward neural net, that's pretty straightforward. You start getting into convolutional, those type of things. Um, at that point, I'd say you're really trying hard to work in R. So, um, so given time today, we'll see how, how far this runs. Um, but I've actually got a 
uh, implementation of the MNIST in R to, to the show. Um, so I'm using Jupyter Notebooks here. For anybody who's not familiar, these are handy. It's a mix of markup and code. Um, and so it allows you to, you know, this is an R command, and then this is the output of that R command. So it's essentially a REPL right in there. Um, so there's a built-in data set in R called uh, mtcars. If you use the R command, uh, we're going to simple linear regression problem here. If you use the R command and put a question mark in front of mtcars, it gives you this data about it. So it tells you that this is a 1974 motor train U.S. magazine data on 32 automobiles. It gives you a quick summary of the format here of the columns. Um, so essentially miles per gallon cylinder, a variety of... Uh, I love how, I want to pick out the here for a minute, I love how they explain that AM is a transmission and 0 equals automatic and 1 equals manual. And VS says V slash S. It's a really helpful explanation. <laughs> Does anybody want to take a guess as to what that is? I know. But... Okay. This is a V engine versus a straight in line. Wow. Um, but you have to Google that in the documentation. That's not helpful. So if we're going to examine the data, um, I'm assuming uh, you know most languages have a head command, which is going to give you just a, a sampling of the rows. Um, so right here, the first few commands we're doing, we're, we're kicking out the first couple of rows. You can see that down below. Um, uh, S applies running across the columns and running the command class. So you see the output here as data types. Um, can, can you make it a little bit larger? Yeah, we built the font here a little bit. So, yeah. okay. Folks in the back, better? Okay. So you see the type down there for the variety of formats, um, and it's all numeric, right? Uh, and the last thing, if you scroll up, I ask for the dimensions of the data set. So 32 records and 11 features. So this isn't rocket science for machine learning, right? As a matter of fact, it's like kind of the opposite problem. We really want more data, typically. Um, but this is uh, nicely correlated data, so it's, and it's easy to understand what it is. So the first thing I'm going to do is partition, test, and uh, I overwrote that when I was typing there. So I should just say, oh, no, that's okay. Partition the test and train data sets. So there's no commas there. We're not doing the test and training yet. Um, so we loaded the carrot library. That's what we loaded a library in R. And I've set the seed for the random initializer. For folks who are programmers and have no idea what that means, don't worry about it. But essentially what it's saying is that the data set partitioning is done random. And I want to not do that randomly. Um, the, this way the, the notebook's repeatable because it's just for documentation purposes. If you have a question about it, if you rerun it, you're always going to get the same set, right? Uh, because I fixed the, the CD. If you don't put that command in there, then, then um, you're getting rid of data. So this function here, create data partition, that's built into caret. That's why I say caret's this meta helper of a bunch of tasks. So I'm saying uh, take the MT cars uh, the output of this is an index, it's just numeric. So I'm not even passing in the whole data frame. I'm just passing in that cylinder column. Um, which actually isn't what I should really pass in. <laughs> I just realized. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, essentially what it does is it lets you, um, since we're doing linear regression in this one, it doesn't matter at all. Um, but if I was doing classification and you pick that column, it just makes sure that whatever column you pick is well represented so that I'm not getting all eight cylinder cars or all four cylinder cars. Or so it's not a bad pick. Um, the P equals seven, that's the probability it's going to end up in that list. So I'm going to take 70% of my data and use that for training data, 30% for test, which is a common percentage, but you'll see it varies 60, 40, 80, 20, depends on your money. Um, so then I'm indexing the car set based on that, and I can do a negative index for the for the test. What, what's a negative index? So it literally just says take every record that doesn't match this index, mm -hmm. um, which I wish I had in a lot of other languages because it's a terribly handy function. Um, so looking at the dimensions of those sets, they both have 11 features. I've now got 23 in my training set, 9 in the, in the test set. So the first thing we're going to do is create a linear model. Um, just of miles per gallon. Uh, so this whole sheet we're doing linear regression, we're going to look for miles per gallon, we're going to try to model that, and we're going to look at just horsepower. It's going to be the only factor we're going to give. 
So you'll see here the function lm. That's just a built-in uh, function in R. Uh, and this mpg tilde hp. Um, so I said we can get too far into syntax, but this is an area worth noting because this comes up a lot. This is something R calls a formula. Um, and so the idea, you can read that tilde as by. So essentially it says miles per gallon by horsepower. Um, you'll notice I'm just passing in the column names as variables, or, or column names, um, without putting them in strings. Uh, that's kind of a magic weird thing of R since I've specified uh, almost all R functions follow this pattern. You pass the data frame into a perimeter called data, and then you can specify columns in other places as if they're variables, even though they aren't variables. It knows to apply those to the data frame. So if you think about those of you who work compilers, there's some weird things going on there. But um, so we look at the, the model. What we get out is an intercept and a coefficient for uh, the horsepower here. I'm going to scroll down where you can sort of see my notes below because they sort of help with this here. So I'm saying at the bottom, you know, the model is miles per gallon is equal to the intercept minus the horsepower coefficient times the horsepower. Um, which makes sense in that as your horsepower goes up, you figure the, the fuel efficiency is going to go down, right? So that's why you see that negative coefficient there. So this is y equals mx plus b, right, for, um, for anybody in sober working in a straight line. Um, if I summary works on a lot of different objects and gives you more details in our, um, this will give you the residuals here, which is effectively the the range of the errors we've missed at most by or we, the least amount we missed uh, was negative is negative five point nine the most by eight um, and then for those of you uh, statisticians in the in the room here we actually get t values and p values in terms of significance of the model by factors um, it's pretty useful to see here especially when you have the factor in isolation. We'll see down below where it gets a little bit more complicated and bring in uh, multiple variables. Right now, when you look at that, you can see, okay, obviously, like, all of these are, they give you the quick codes at the bottom here. Of effectively, zero is going to be three stars of significance, um, you know, on down to that threshold that's so common for, for uh, p values of 0.05 um, is a single star, and then below that, you don't get anything. So, Right now, it's saying that both of these are very significant, which makes sense. They're the only thing in the model. Um, and if you, you see the graph, it's a useful start to a model. See a question back? Yeah, I was just going to ask about the model and, and whether or not R allows you to set the intercept to be a certain value. Because, I mean, the intercept here doesn't make sense to be a number, right? Um, if horsepower is zero. Yeah, I mean, obviously, though, the, the, the model doesn't predict outside reasonable bounds, right? I mean, that's, it's, um, I'm just saying with the horsepower of zero, what would we expect miles per gallon to be? Yeah, I mean, to say it's going to be 30, that's obviously nonsensical, but, but, I mean, that's, that's one of your models, right? They're limited to the domain of the data. Yeah. If you really want, you could go back and adjust that formula with the concept. Which will kind of level that out, but yeah, oh, that's what I was asking. But, so but the, R allows you to do the, the, inter, the intercept making sense or not making sense really doesn't. To Tim's point, doesn't matter for, for what this is going to do. Yeah, I mean for. I mean that's a, an issue with machine learning, right? Is you're, you're predicting within the scope of the data you've got. Um, in terms of actually passing the parameter, right? We can pull that up if we have a few minutes on the. Um, we see how we're doing on time towards the end, um, but whether you can fix the intercept or not. Question. I would just say that, uh, and from our point of view, I would say build a model to fit the data, and then if you find the intercept isn't zero, it tells you there's bias in your data. Right. So okay. right. right. That, that makes sense. noise in your data. I mean, because if you're doing machine learning and, and you're going to do a prediction, then that could this could potentially be an issue. I mean, talking about the range of the data and what what data you want to, uh, you you know, what the, what the bounds of the data are. I understand that, but you know, well, that's part of what keeps us having jobs, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what would have meaning. Like, what's 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 the meaning of negative horsepower? I, you know, I mean, like it's I don't know. 
we need philosophers as well as statisticians. <laughs> um, which is certainly outside of my god. So, um, so one of the things we're going to do to look at the the output of this and to judge it a little bit here is we're going to use root mean squared error. Um, so this is common in there, and I'm probably preaching to the choir based on this room. Um, but I put the formula in there, and that's just essentially, you know, you're squaring and then averaging the, the error uh, to get out the negative, uh, and then going back to square root of it. Um, and so here, I'm, this is the actual prediction code. Um, so this predict function works across a number of modeling techniques. Um, it's going to output a vector of the predictions. So I'm adding that on as an additional column, and now I'm spinning out uh, the data set. It's a small data set to say, okay, for the horsepower, here's the actual MBG, and then here's the predicted. Uh, and then I've brought in a goodness of fit library, a root mean squared error, <coughs> would be four lines of code to write, but um, it just uh, allowed me to put it in. So looking down at the bottom, the secondary output first, you see the root mean squared error is about you know, what 4.64. Um, and you can see where the, the values are at. They move up and down with it. Um, it's not perfect, but it's not terrible. It's more useful to plot it. So uh, I brought in ggplot2. It's a great library uh, written by Adam Wickham uh, that I referred to earlier, but I'm not going to uh, get into the scope of ggplot2 is one of the steeper running curves in R. Um, but you'll see here the, the green line is the, the um, actual mile per, miles per gallon in our model, since it was simple, one variable uh, is indeed a straight line, right? That you expect back to y equals mx plus b. So let's get interesting and bring in some more factors, right? So for the second model, um, all I'm changing here is to now say miles per gallon plus by horsepower uh, displacement and weight. Worth noting here, it looks like I'm adding them all together. I'm not. That's a convention of formulas in R, is you're saying those discrete fields. Um, and so um, it's just going to use all of those different fields in the model. Um, and so now you'll see, OK, my intercept's here, and I've got the coefficients. Uh, you know, weight you would expect is going to go, uh, your, your mile is just going to go down as your weight goes up. Uh, that looks really big, right? But remember that it was in tons. So um, that's part of the reason that uh, the movement's so high. Um, it is not, you don't lose a mile per gallon of every pound of the vehicle, it's per ton. Uh, you lose 4.8. Um, so looking at the residuals here, you're actually seeing a little more detail on this one. Um, so here's where I mentioned, looking down here at the coefficients, for example. Um, the p values, none of them rise to the level of significance. However, our model is improved. So that's why I say it's not when you bring multiple factors into the model, that same 5% guideline doesn't necessarily apply. You have to consider these relative and look at them against each other. So I would just look at this and say, okay, the t value uh, is further from zero on horsepower and weight, where displacement is closer. And in displacement, um, was the, the coefficient there was very small. So you can begin to look at that and say, is there value in displacement of this model or not? Um, but already for, for, you know, I don't know if anybody wants to comment of, of the surprises that are not for the folks who have done machine learning before, but this is the type of stuff I'm talking about where you can get much, this is much closer than to traditional statistics than you would see in like your average demo of sklearn or tensorflow or those type of things. Um, it, people don't necessarily jump to these techniques where in R they're kind of front and center for you. Um, so it's kind of worth noting about how this goes. Uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I know some question on time here. So again, we're predicting the results, we're looking at them, and the, the root mean square error is a little better at this point. You see there we're down below the three, so 2.89. So I graph, and as expected, it, it seems to follow that uh, the blue line a little bit closer. No, it's a lot. So now jumping to, I just use the linear model directly with, with no changes. Um, so what does carrot gain? So why would I use that over um, the linear model directly? So here, um, 
let's kind of skip the first statement for a second and look at the second. This train is the primary method and interface into caret for training. So now I've given a formula. Um, I'll come back to the formula in a second. I've given it the data set, uh, preprocess, a method of LM. So I'm telling you to use the same linear uh, model algorithm I used earlier, and then this uh, training control variable. So let's go through some of the differences real quick. Um, Preprocess, let's start there. So folks who have done machine learning might know that the algorithms you're using, you know, gradient descent and these type of things, in order to hone in on the, the, the best answer, they, they work more efficiently when the data is roughly within the same ranges. So what I mean is that if you have one variable that tends to be up, if we put weight in pounds, right, and these were 5,000 pound cars, and yet you had other variables that are zeros and ones, uh, it's going to be very inefficient about finding the line of best fit. It's going to take a lot more iterations. Um, so if you scale that data so it was all within reasonably the same scale, right, it can be deviations, you know, standard deviation from the mean, it can be a variety of ways of doing that. Um, Carrot's just going to do it for me. I said center the data and scale it. Done. Um, that's huge. If you have to write that yourself, it's just a pain in the butt in this code. You have to maintain and test for, for no reason. Um, this train control, I'm telling it to do cross-validation, two-fold cross-validation, 60% sets on it. Um, which is a little weird because I already partitioned the data right, but the whole point is I want to validate and show you at the end these results on completely untouched data. Um, so we're still cross-validating. Um, and again, I have to write in a cross-validation code. It's just there. Um, additionally, when I look at the model, you can get some different outputs. Um, right away, it's telling you the root mean squared error on the set that it trained on, uh, as well as R squared there. It gives you some description of how, the, um, how that was generated. Uh, predicting that model, again, looks the same thing. You actually notice my root mean square error is a touch higher here. Um, it's a very, very small sample set. I think when you actually look at the graph, it, it looks like it fits a touch better. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, larger days, that's what validate. The point here is we're not, we're not splitting hairs on that. I did forget one thing. I want to skip up. This model here, I had changed. Uh, instead of using a plus, I used a star. Uh, it's, Awfully nice. What it does is you actually notice here in the coefficients, I'll highlight the line, yes. cross product. So you've got the horsepower, the weight, and then a factor of the both of them. Um, especially if you think about um, techniques that use neural nets on structured data problems, oftentimes what those the nodes are doing in a neural net is getting relationships between certain uh, nodes, or certain features, excuse me. Um, and you can kind of cheat that with standard logistic regression models by, by using the dot product in here. Um, somebody mathematically checked that later, but it works. Um, so, skipping to the graph here, um, you know, again, we saw, we saw that. So this next one's a little bit shorter. Um, this is just to show, uh, so linear regression doesn't even mean it. It's, it's kind of a nice one for demonstration purposes, but classification is kind of a more standard uh, type of problems. So uh, this one, again, I pulled this up for a second just to say uh, this highlights kind of some different features of the, the libraries. A lot of these features in here are flags. They're zeros and ones. So we just treated them as that in the linear model. Um, Carrot does nicely if you make those factors. So factors are... Um, essentially almost like enums in R, like it's, it's telling it that it's a discrete variable that can have certain values and allows you to even give labels for those values. Um, so I'll give an example here. I've, I've done that for a bunch of things, the uh, V versus straight inline, automatic versus manual, gear, the number of gears, the number of carburetors, um, and the cylinders, but I'm just spitting out at the end the cylinders to show you what it now looks like. Now cylinders, are this factor, which isn't a string, it's kind of an integer underneath, but if you ask for it, it gives you the label of four cylinders. Um, and this is a count of which of those, uh, you know, so we've got 11 four cylinder cars, seven six cylinder cars, whatever. Other than looking better, the real key that this does is once our, once Carrot sees it as a factor, and it will actually 
auto create those as bit fields for you. So under the covers, if you've done this before, you would, you know, and you, where you have a number that's a code for something, you know, sex is zero or one. It's kind of weird to treat that as a linear item in your model. So you prefer to have, um, I mean, gender's a bad one because it's two, so you can have just single field zero or one. But with multiple factors, such as the cylinders of the car, four, six, and eight aren't meaningful numbers, right? Um, in a, in a linear fashion. So the carrot automatically creates those bit fields for you and treats as that. Particularly in classification, that's handy. Um, so we'll skip to get to that. So here I'm setting this, I'm partitioning the data again, nothing to show there. Um, this is the other concept I want to show is a tuning grid. This is really handy of what uh, carrot brings in. So I'm doing this with an algorithm called multinomial. Uh, multinomial regression. This is actually a neural net that does multi-class classification. It takes a decay parameter. I don't know what the best decay parameter is. So you putting this is a, a range of 30 to 50 over a fraction of 40. So I'm saying give me values a little less than one, a little greater than one, in between. And it's going to pass those in. It's going to rerun the model over all of those possibilities and give you the best model out of it. When there's a function um, I can show later, um, probably next we're out of time, but um, an expand grid that actually lets you pass in, if, I, um, if there was multiple variables, I could pass in multiple ranges, it would give you all possible permutations. Between that and the iterative running over, that's going to save you a lot of hassle of tuning hyperparameters, uh, which is a lot of the work of looking at these models, right? Your regularization parameters, all these things for, for the fitting. So I've actually output the tuning grid here just so you can see like this is what that first line created as a data frame. These values on up to one, two, five. Um, the output of the model is not very useful. I'm gonna scroll past that. Um, but where this gets interesting is this line here. You see the output of that. So it says accuracy was used to select the optimal model using the largest value. The final value for the model was decay equals 1.25. <coughs> Um, which actually is my highest value, which means if I was really doing this, to, I, should, I should increase my size on there. So, the prediction, um, again, because it's a factor, this is really nice. I just pass it in, it gives me the prediction back as a factor, and if you actually look, we're dead on, on everything. Um, oh no, we missed, we missed four. Um, yeah, so our accuracy is about 88%. Uh, most of the time, this one I didn't set the seed, so it runs randomly. Um, but most of the time, I don't see it miss. Um, so, confusion matrix uh, is a built-in uh, again into caret. You'll see it on the top here; it's calling it reference, which is the actual answer, and then down the left is our prediction. Mm -hmm. So, you're obviously looking for down the axis here. You're looking for uh, that's correct. Anything else? Well, this one down here is our miss. So, we had an actual six cylinder that we thought was an eight cylinder. Um, and I just plugged this in at the last minute, not too helpful with three, I mean the confusion matrix is easy to read, but just to show ggplot has, uh, with the tile, has some really nice functionality. If, if you had a much more complicated uh, number of classes, that can be a really handy uh, set to look at. So jumping back to the slides here, I hit both of those. Um, so bonus topics, I was going to put these in if we got time, we, we don't. So. Um, so somebody here, I think, saw the talk I did at the R group on XGBoost. I linked to a library of using that directly. Um, that's a, there's a Python implementation of XGBoost that's a pretty popular one for um, XGBoost. Uh, in, the, in the Kaggle talk I referred to earlier, the CEO says that, makes a statement, it's true that uh, in the structured data contest, uh, gradient boosting is, is dominating. So that's a handy algorithm to look at. You can look at an implementation in R, in R by looking at that. Um, I also wrote the, the uh, neural net in this demo. I'm not going to show that. I'm going to pull up RStudio for just one second to show um, what I said earlier about the tuning grid. So if you see this line here where I said expand grid, size, and decay, this is a different algorithm. If I output that, 
you see on the bottom right. So you see there that I said, okay, I want a two-layer or a four-layer neural network, and I want decay to be 4, 7, 5, or 5, and it's auto-created those permutations for me. Uh, in this, there was four permutations. It's not hard, but uh, in another world with a lot of uh, permutations, that could be useful. So I've linked in the slides to uh, the notebooks for this talk I have up on GitHub. Um, I'll post this slide deck link uh, to the meetup. Um, so blog post in here, I posted it's a real nice overview of some of the stronger packages in R for machine learning. The carrot documentation online is fantastic. In this last one here, I actually have the tab up to show quickly. Um, this page has all models by tag. So you can go in and say, uh, I'm looking for a logistic progression model. I'm looking for uh, some sort of random forest, or I'm, you know, these type of things. And it will, by clicking any one of these, so saying that we looked for a random forest model, it would give you all the different variations of algorithms and what the parameters are that you can pass to tune to those. So that's a really handy page to refer to. Uh, so in closing, we've only scratched the surface of this. Obviously, uh, there's a short talk about the intros of it. I appreciate everyone taking the time to come here and listen today. And um, a reminder to register for that July 12th event. And questions, comments, feedback?